Can you remember your first impressions of this documentary? Like, do you remember the first time you saw it? Yes. Okay. So I think I am interested in this documentary because the first time I saw it, I loved it. Honestly, I ate it up. I had such a good time. I still have a really good time when I watch it. When I when I think about this documentary as a piece of entertainment, I think I'm still very much on board with it. But the first time I watched it, uh, I don't want to say it was at the beginning point that I was watching documentaries or these types of documentaries, but it was closer to the beginning than where I am now. So I was definitely just in a very consumptive mind frame uh, not really questioning too much. I mean, I, I won't say that I didn't question the ideas overall, but just the pieces of the documentary themselves. I it just it just all came at me, and I had a really good time. And uh, yeah, that was honestly my first impression: is just having a great time watching a documentary that I then wanted all of my friends to watch themselves. What about you? Well, can you remember, d- did you feel that way like all the way through, like even into into part three? Uh, I think I was pretty sucked in by the first part. So I, I, I would love to be able to tell you that I was like really scouring part three with a critical eye. But for one, I honestly don't remember my reception of that, that part specifically. But I also don't, I, I don't think I can even... To pat myself on the back and be like I probably thought it was all bullshit like mm. I, I think I probably was just like jaw drop just wow the aliens are out there the government is out to get us not a whole lot going on and, and I think that's fine too to a certain degree um, but that doesn't mean that I think it's fine that he's making this stuff in this way overall mm. I can remember the first time I watched this movie because I think it was... It was with me. It was the first time we tried talking through the movie, right? I think was the first time you'd seen it. I thought we'd watched the first part of it together. We had seen the first part of it. And then we rewatched for impressions after that. Yeah. yeah. I... uh, Even now that I know Mm -hmm. what I know, Mm -hmm. uh, which was what we'll be getting into today, Mm -hmm. like... It is still a compelling documentary, mm-hmm. but like it's hard for me now to separate the goofiness mm-hmm. of of some parts of it mm-hmm. with like my initial watching. Because even the first time I saw this movie, I had already seen Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, which is and I saw. I, I think that is kind of our point of departure to a certain degree. Is not only was unacknowledged. Uh, one of the first documentaries I'd seen on aliens period, Mm -hmm. but I watched it before close encounters of the fifth kind. And it's, I'm not saying it's hard to notice the problems with unacknowledged, but it's really hard not to notice the problems with unacknowledged Mm -hmm. after you've watched close encounters. So, and I think that's why for me, the parts of this documentary were always hard to take seriously because I had seen and not even really wanted to finish Mm -hmm. close encounters of the fifth kind, because similarly to this movie, which we're going to get into is like Greer, Stephen Greer, Dr. Stephen Greer. Uh, he calls himself a trauma doctor at one point. He also calls himself a country doctor Mm -hmm. on one of his websites. Um, he really becomes the hero of, both of them and Mm -hmm. a standout moment i remember from close encounters of the fifth kind is that some aliens appear and steven greer relates a story where his roommate then barges into his room and said what did you do and and i don't remember this at all (laughs) it gives this impression that like you know steven greer has these powers or Mm -hmm. whatever like this ability that other people don't have and i think because of that, there was just always an element of this documentary that kept me from totally yeah. getting into it. Um, and especially my most recent rewatching of it, by the third part, I was just kind of casually mm-hmm. researching things on the fly. And man, I don't know. Th- this movie's really kooky. I'm pretty excited 
to to talk about it. Well, and I think that's why. So there's probably about a year in between me seeing it the first time and seeing it the second time. And what transpired in that year uh, was for me probably more watching of documentaries. It was the pandemic, and watching so many documentaries allowed me to uh, develop pet peeves about documentaries themselves and what I do and do not like about, or what I think what I think makes like a quality documentary that seems to be developed with the intention of relaying information or facts in the most clear and concise way as po- as possible which is not to say that document like documentaries are always going to have their own biases and motivations of course but some documentaries seem to more intentionally obfuscate information than other documentaries like in just the way that the information is given so this uh, a year later in rewatching this documentary and having seen so many documentaries in between really showed me that this documentary, which I didn't even realize in that first rewatching, because I was just like, you know, you're at home, you click on it. What's it going to be? I had no expectations. I may not have been watching it super closely. I don't remember. Um, But I didn't realize how much Stephen Greer was the project. Like it was the Stephen Greer show. Like he's not just another person being interviewed within the documentary. He is putting the documentary on. It is his project. And I think that's something that's subtly not (laughs) intentionally said outright in certain parts of the documentary. And watching so many documentaries led me to see some of the problems with documentary as a form. I mean, they're generally speaking, what, two hours, maybe. So that's not very long to be giving so much information and so much information that you just can't go through and and find all of the the support and the references for. So you're given this presumption that it's going to be factual. You go through it really fast. You don't remember everything by the time it's over. You're just left with an impression. And I think Unacknowledged does a really good job at leaving you with a particular feeling or impression. But it doesn't do so good at relaying the information in a way that you always are oriented to who's giving the information, why they're giving the information. And even if we're sticking to a particular story at any given time, like just like an actual, like telling a story from beginning to end, there's a lot of bopping around, which I didn't see the first time, but was very obvious a year later the second time. I think it's interesting you pointed out, you know, any documentary has biases and a certain angle like especially nowadays documentaries seem to be getting more and more creative and how they're put together Mm -hmm. and how we receive the information from them uh something in this movie that stuck out to me a lot more on the on the rewatchings of it is like skepticism is is a is a big tool in Mm -hmm. this movie and how the movie wants you to think about skepticism changes a lot. Like it wants you to be ever skeptical toward the government, which I'm not saying you shouldn't be, (laughs) but it wants you to never be skeptical toward Greer. Mm -hmm. And we we're going to talk about a few broad topics today. We're going to talk about Greer specifically. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about the use of quotations in the movie. Uh, There are 13 quotations that appear in this movie about every 10 minutes uh, to various rhetorical effects. Um, but the main thing that I think is interesting is that like Greer asks us to take a lot of leaps of faith with him and it just muddles the viewer's relationship with skepticism. Right. I, I and think. we're asked to take these leaps of faith, but then just, we just blast through the information itself and it's, I don't know why we're supposed to hop on board with these ideas when they're not even broken down for us in a way that makes them easy to internalize. Do you think uh, with all this said, we should get into Stephen Greer? Yeah, let's get into to Stephen Greer. Can you give us a breakdown of who he is? I mean, I know you've already said <laughs> we know he's a doctor. He is a doctor. Stephen Greer is a doctor. Stephen Greer, um, 
oh man where do i even start with him uh he's a filmmaker i guess we can assume as well um he is because he's made unacknowledged before unacknowledged he made serious Mm -hmm. after unacknowledged he made close encounters of the fifth kind Mm -hmm. and we just found out just now he has a new movie which is called the cosmic hoax the cosmic hoax uh and the cosmic hoax colon and expose uh stephen greer is an interesting man um for those familiar with George Knapp, a uh, pretty prominent UFO uh, journalist, George Knapp is not uh, a fan of Stephen Greer. Mm-hmm. Um, he considers him, let's see, he says he has not met Stephen Greer, but he's not a fan. Uh, every time I get an email from him, he is asking people for money. Uh, and it always seems like the issue of the day is about him more so than the phenomena, UFOs, aliens. And, and that's what I'm saying about the documentary itself being the Stephen Greer show. Uh, most of his uh, appearances in an un- unacknowledged are him in what looks like a, a weird <laughs> warehouse. He's sitting on a bar stool. He's being interviewed, but it's his documentary. Like, I... I don't understand why he's being interviewed like the other people in his document. It just, to me, it it creates a sense of disorientation because the fact that he's being interviewed by another person seems to say that he's just another piece of evidence within the documentary, not he's the orchestrator of the information. And that feels misleading to me. I think another thing about Stephen Greer uh, that sticks out to me is it's not just that he like blends in with the cast like Mm -hmm. the movie consistently makes him out to be this sort of larger than life hero uh (laughs) very early in the film so after the intro which i'd like to talk about a bit as well but after the intro to the documentary uh stephen greer is giving this monologue where he essentially says his biggest regret of his entire career trying to do this ufo disclosure is that no one has been as brave as him is basically what he says he says he says if one percent of the people he had talked to had come forward this would be a done deal we'd all know about aliens it pans to a photograph of john f kennedy Mm -hmm. uh and a quotation talking about the loneliest job in the world loneliest (laughs) job so stephen greer is already like connecting himself to like a very lofty position um, in this documentary. There is even a scene where the film is outlining what sort of led Stephen Greer to branch out on his own and decide UFO disclosure. It's all going to come down to me. Uh, And there's this shot in the film with the Washington monument in the background and Stephen Greer puts on his shades, turns away from Washington and goes his own way. And uh, (laughs) again, like, is this on acknowledge the story of UFOs or is this on acknowledge the story of Of Stephen Greer, Greer. the hero disclosing UFOs to us all being heroic? Uh, Doesn't he say something about how if if something bad happens to him? If he winds up dead, and all of the information is going to be disclosed. Is that in the documentary or is I, that just some piece of research we found along I, the line? I think that was a different uh, piece of research. We'll have to find that because that's ever more just him mm-hmm. as the Christ figure <laughs> but, persecuted. Uh, I don't want people to think we're just like shitting on him. We have research we've done that kind of proves Stephen Greer is not quite what he makes himself out to be, uh, which I think... One of the biggest beginnings of that is the whole National Press Club thing. Yes. So I'll I'll contextualize this, and then you can sort of feed mm-hmm. us some of the facts. So in this movie, uh, in 2001, Stephen Greer held a press conference at the National Press Club where the Disclosure Project and all of his UFO evidence stuff, which, by the way, is signified in the movie at one point with a pink post-it note that says proof (laughs) on it uh amazing stock footage it's says proof uh uh he he holds this press conference and we learned some things about the national press club which we found interesting yeah okay so this is kind of what i mean by greer does not present the information that clearly says 
what it is, how it interacts with everything else, and how it can be interpreted in a way that I think makes the evidence itself clear. So when he talks about the National Press Club, first of all, who knows what the National Press Club is? It sounds like something that we should already know what it is because it sounds official. It sounds important. It's in Washington. So we kind of have the assumption that it's somehow involved with politics. It's involved with important people. I literally thought it involved the government. Right, The, the first time I saw the movie. Because you affiliate the National Press Club, it, it sounds like... Um, oh. Like the, a press secretary, like someone that's disclosing from Washington information to to journalists. And it is a journalistic organization that is sort of more or less true. Uh, but I'm just saying like the fact that the first impression that we get of it is that it's official. But yet I suspect it's a very minimal amount of the population that actually knows what it is. And for the rest of us, it's just like, oh, Something official, something important, something credible. Well, when you do just a tertiary Google of what the National Press Club is, what you find is it's, it is a club. It's like something that if you are a journalist in any capacity, not like you have to have a special set of credentials or you have to have gone to a specific school. It's like, oh, do you produce anything for the media? If so, yes, you may join. So the bar for entry is incredibly low. But for two, when you Google it, what immediately comes up? And it's that it's a business that can be booked for events in Washington, D.C. Like, literally, you go, it's a venue booking website. Like, anyone can make an effort, pay the fees, whatever, and host their event at the National Press Club. Well, why is that problematic, both in the way that it's represented in the documentary uh, and as a, a source itself, it comes from nowhere. It's a thing that Greer, it's an event that Greer created, which isn't bad, but saying that it's the, he, he says it's the largest. He says it's the most viewed the most press conference. Press conference at the National <laughs> Press Club, right? Yeah. Gives us no numbers, by the way. Gives no us numbers. no context. He do, we don't have a context for who is viewing. We don't know if that means the amount of people in the room. Right. We don't know if that means this was televised, perhaps on a news network, right. which we found zero <laughs> evidence <laughs> for. Zero evidence of. Uh, there was even a, a comment from from a journalist um, who who attended it, and was just like, "Yeah, it was a pretty good outing. There were some people there, but." It, Right. He doesn't say the room was filled. He doesn't say that, like, you know, people were asking Greer questions. Mm -hmm. So the movie says most viewed event at the National Press Club. And here's who can't view it, at least from the research we've done, me and you. So one thing I noticed while researching Stephen Greer um, is that, and I'll, I'll loop this back around to the National Press Club you you would think like by googling Stephen Greer it would be pretty easy to find his website, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't actually until today, through kind of a roundabout way, I found a a, a booking mm -hmm. for Stephen Greer's personal retreats, which I'll also get into later, uh, where I found seriousdisclosure.com, which is Stephen Greer's website. Uh, unfortunately, which wasn't easy to find, right? Like that wasn't like the first thing that popped up. Whenever not, you not easy to find. Um, and the weird thing is, it it claims to have footage of the the National Press Club event. Mm -hmm. When you click on it, though, it's a dead link. Yes, this is what I what I was getting to. <laughs> this is where I, I was going, which is. If this is such a significant part of the documentary, why can't I find an unedited, uncut presentation of the National Press Club conference on mm -hmm. the Disclosure Project? I should be able to watch that from beginning to end and know every single person that Greer got to speak at this event. Mm -hmm. But you don't have that. so No, it's <laughs> inaccessible as far as we can say. See. And uh, that's sort of a running theme. I'm not going to get too much into his website right now, uh, but it is full of broken links. It's full of pictures that you can see a little thumbnail of them. And if you click on wanting to see the bigger one, the link, is, the link is broken. Uh, so again, like... 
Which at two thousand uh, dollars, it was at two thousand dollars a pop. It's two thousand nine hundred and eighty dollars a pop to go to his retreat to, to join Stephen you, Greer on a retreat. Yeah, <laughs> Stephen Greer, you can afford for site maintenance if you're charging people three thousand dollars to go to your events i have seen how large those events are from the close encounters of the fifth kind documentary there's like 50 people there Mm -hmm. you can someone can maintain the website yeah and if 30 people are paying you three thousand dollars how much money is that well don't ask me yeah i don't know on the fly but it's (laughs) it's a lot of money I think I just want to read the who can join portion of the National Press Club's website. It says, if you work, study, or participate in activities that involve creating, producing, or distributing news or other content as part of news gathering process, you are eligible, eligible to become a member of the National Press Club. Journalism and media professionals, public relations professionals, writers and authors, students and educators. Ready to join? Click here to apply. I just I just can't get over the fact that something we're meant to believe is a significant event in in Washington and the world at large the the organization itself is basically contentless it's yeah. just a, a hosting organization And you might be listening to this. If there's like a Stephen Greer fan listening to this, you might be kind of thinking like, why are we throwing this guy under the bus? He's just wanting to do a nice thing. He's wanting to teach people the truth about aliens. And like, the thing is, the more I learn about Stephen Greer, the more I think his style of manipulation isn't all that different from the style of government manipulation. Mm -hmm. Stephen Greer makes you think that this disclosure project is like this huge thing with, Mm -hmm. with all this support. But like a lot of times in the documentary itself, they flash the name of the person talking for literally less than a second and you can't see who it is. And like one of our biggest points of contention with this movie is like, okay, Stephen Greer, your goal is to prove basically that aliens are real. Shouldn't your main goal then, he calls it a uh, embarrassment of riches Mm -hmm. is all the evidence we have. I feel like through watching this movie, I never really get that satisfied. Mm -hmm. And by the time part two is over, right when it starts to get good, part three is almost all about alternative energy and all this bullshit and, and things that don't take that much Google searching to easily disprove. Mm -hmm. And like, are you talking about the car? The car, the the water car. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Tell us what you found out about the water car. The water car basically didn't work at all. It was a guy with another version of a fucking perpetual motion machine. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't real. And like, I, I can still understand if someone listening to this, if that's not enough for them, Stephen Greer does not, do the legwork I think required to, to help us believe his evidence. Yeah. And, and I, I kind of think that's what went for me enjoying the documentary as like literally just, just a fun piece of entertainment, which I think still is something that I'm, I'm on board with the documentary being, Mm -hmm. but especially with everything that has happened in terms of the distrust of media, people that are, purporting to be revealing information need to be holding themselves to the highest possible degree of how they relay that information. I mean, this is like basic college English paper writing sort of stuff. Show us your sources. Be clear. Where is the information coming from? There's a lot of information in this documentary, but we leapfrog from topic to topic from thing to thing from person to person so fast in such a rapid succession that mm-hmm. yes as a viewer watching it for entertainment it, you have this sensation like your your interest is always being peaked you're like wow this that you're just you're always kind of kept on edge but when you slow that down a little bit and you start trying to connect the things to each other or even just be sure that you're staying on the same track of thinking things get very muddled this ended up being so much harder to talk about than i initially thought it was going to be because i didn't realize how non-linear it was until i started to look a little bit more closely and i'd actually now uh i was just speaking about evidence i'd like to present a piece of my own uh there's a part of this movie where 
Dr. St- Stephen Greer gets very worked up about something. He actually starts to cry during his oh, interview. Oh, yes, the tears. And he says he's getting so worked up because there was a time where he attended this dinner party and someone mm-hmm. basically invited him to debrief. Uh, let's see who it was. Was it? It was James, James Wolsey, who was the former director of the CIA. So the way this is presented in the movie is Stephen Greer is trying to give you a sense for how deep the rabbit hole goes. Uh, and the main argument he's making is a lot of these alien programs have become so hidden within black budget government stuff that even the president, even the director of the CIA no longer knows about them. Uh, and I have to say, I actually think in a lot of ways this is true. Right. Uh, that, that's something that I can get on board with with a concept. Yeah. But I don't think the documentary <laughs> itself does a very good I, good. Uh, job of demonstrating yeah because because (laughs) Stephen Greer again he says um that one of the high points of his career one of the craziest parts of his career was he got to debrief uh the former director of the CIA basically about UFOs um which what which what does that imply that a meeting has been set up between himself and the director of the CIA so this is something that has been orchestrated for him specifically to relay that piece of information that's the way the documentary makes it seem mm-hmm. but that's not how it went down yeah so i'm just going to read this in its entirety it's just three paragraphs this is a letter uh d- addressed to Dr. Greer after this happened this letter is from uh, 1999. So this is actually before the official National Press Club uh, event. So anyway, uh, dear Dr. Greer, it has just come to the attention of the four of us, this is Dr. Wolsey and two other people who were in attendance, that you have, without giving any of us the opportunity to comment, uh, published a distorted account of a dinner party of some six years ago at which the four of us, you and your wife, were seated together. In the introduction to your book, Extraterrestrial Contact, published earlier this year, you portray this dinner party conversation during which the four of us listened to your views and politely asked questions as a briefing with a cover story. You further assert that Mr. and Mrs. Wolsey reported a UFO sighting to you and agreed with your views. You include specific alleged quotations from them. None of this is accurate. You have portrayed politeness as acquaintance and questions as affirmations. Your conduct in this manner contravenes both accuracy and simple manners. This is signed by the four people. It says John L. Peterson, Diane Peterson, uh, James Wolsey, and uh, Suzanne Wolsey. Uh, So again, I can see a stalwart Greer supporter Mm -hmm. saying maybe these government people freaked out and issued this letter later, like blah, 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 blah. And it does seem to say that in the book itself, it is made clear that this is a dinner party, not a meeting. Mm -hmm. But that's not how it's shown in the documentary itself, which is going to have a far wider reach to the public than than the book that he wrote. Mm -hmm. So if anyone did listen to the thing I just read and it just made you agree with Greer more because you don't trust these government people, my response to you would be, is to watch the documentary and look at the way this topic is brought up. And the way that at least Dr. Greer understands it is that a debriefing happened. Right. This was a dinner party. Mm-hmm. Like four people are attesting this was a dinner party. Right. So even if you believe that Wolsey was instructed by the government to clarify this in, in this memo or this letter that he sent to Greer for the purposes of like, oh, you've said too much, Wolsey. You need to backtrack this. You need to discredit uh, Greer on on this information. Sure, we can hypothesize that, but that doesn't detract from the fact that the way the evidence was given to us in the documentary was misleading. And at the point that that evidence has been shown to be incomplete or misleading, that calls into question literally everything else. And that's what I mean when I say that Greer needs to be held or holding himself to a higher standard. I shouldn't be able to literally just scratch the surface of the evidence as he's portraying it and find that there are key ways in which the the way it's been portrayed to us is incorrect. Like, Mm -hmm. tell us it's a dinner party. Which also happens with the, the little human skeleton uh, that's shown in the movie of, or sorry, potentially alien skeleton. 
Uh, to Dr. Greer, both in the film and on his website, he still maintains that this is this is an alien. And it's called the Atacama? The, the Atacama... Uh, humanoid? Humanoid. Yeah, the Atacama humanoid. A-T-A-C-A-M-A. Uh, so on the... On the SeriousDisclosure.com site, uh, there's wild speculation about how this is an alien skeleton. Um, For this, I was actually going to give Dr. Greer the benefit of the doubt a little bit, um, is that when I researched this in 2020, uh, a certain amount of like forensic tests had come back that basically concluded it was just a human... Uh, like fetus with a bone disorder basically Uh, that information did come out after unacknowledged came out so it it is here's the thing though yeah it didn't it didn't yes because i secretly watched sirius the first stephen greer documentary and i know that those dna testing results came back and they reported in the documentary that the genetic material as far as anyone could see was human and yet in that documentary even after that they don't say debunked they say we gotta we gotta do more tests we gotta do more (laughs) it's like okay so clearly this is partially human even though there's no there's no alien quote-unquote dna Mm -hmm. and they just fully continue to represent that as some type of alien proof. It was already debunked in his original documentary. That's insane. And the docu and, and this is featured again in Unacknowledged. It's like, probably it's probably in the new movie too, I, I would bet. And again, th- this is all just to kind of establish a pattern of Dr. Greer just saying things that aren't that aren't quite what they are. Like, for example, when he says something like the Disclosure Project, he often makes it seem like it's this worldwide movement. It's all these people coming together when it's really just Stephen Greer. The, yeah, the documentary... how, how easy was it to find that Disclosure Project website if it's... <laughs> If it's such a movement, Mm -hmm. if we're supposed to sign the proverbial petition, why can't I immediately find that? Maybe his web development budget and SEO (laughs) dollars could could maybe be increased a little bit. Uh, The movie also, which is narrated by... uh, Oh, yes, yes. (laughs) This, This is very important to me. His name is Giancarlo Esposito. Yeah, and... I think things that kind of are ridiculous sound less ridiculous when they're narrated by him. Uh, For example, the thing I was going to bring up is that a few times in the movie, it says Dr. Greer is opening his archives and (laughs) like it's, it gives this impression that like Greer is just sitting on this gold mine of, of things. And again, like let's just say that's true. We get so little of that in this movie. We get a lot of interviews with people. Which, for the record, a lot of those interviews don't even necessarily seem to be source material from Greer himself. They seem to be some sort of, I don't know, they, yeah. they come from other places, other documentaries, other sources. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, on more than one occasion, like there are clips in this movie I've just seen in other movies. Like mm-hmm. anything with Gordon Cooper is probably just from another movie. Mm-hmm. Like these these sort of vague quotes they use every 10 mm-hmm. minutes. Like there's nothing particular about them that, that are of Stephen Greer. Most of the original content is Stephen Greer sitting on that bar stool <laughs> <Yeah>. crying. <laughs> yeah. So again, Stephen Greer's archives, what does that even mean? Like I have archives. I have a bunch of bullshit in my apartment. If I, I can open my archives to anybody any goddamn day of the week. So. I have a junk drawer full of USBs. Yeah. <laughs> like what what is stopping Dr. Greer in this movie from showing us a fucking photograph of like an alien body? You know what I mean? Like does he really have anything? He 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 has some good interviews. He mm-hmm. seems to have conducted. And I for one will always find those interviews mm-hmm. compelling. Uh, so again, I don't want someone listening to this to be like, oh, I don't believe in any of the nuclear test sighting, mm-hmm. you know, but, s- stuff. But even so, when you're talking about the interviews, I would have, and maybe this is something you've already done. I haven't, but I haven't gone through the documentary itself to organize which documentaries came from him or one of his previous movies and which interviews came from an outside source. And, and I think, 
I think that's probably a, a level of research that we could eventually do. Well, you know what would make that research easy if his website wasn't full of broken links. Right. In, in, <laughs> for his, for his, wouldn't you say, wouldn't you just assume that his, his archives that he's talking about in this documentary, his website is also going to have a certain degree of that information? Like... This again, this anyone can go on this. You go on seriousdisclosure.com, you click on the evidence tab, you scroll down, the first the first heading, featured video evidence, two thousand one National Press Club event, not available on YouTube. Is it the government taking it down? Maybe. But okay. So <laughs> the government takes it off of YouTube. That's still no excuse for the fact. Why doesn't he have his own MP3 or whatever to put this up on his website in a format that another outsourced website can't just rip it down anytime it wants? Like it, he, he knows people are trying to to take down the alien information. He's telling us that. Yeah. So why wouldn't he protect his information from being taken down so easily in those channels? Mm-hmm. It doesn't make sense unless he doesn't care how legitimate the evidence is. Yeah. My uh, what the conclusion I come to is Stephen Greer is it truly is just the Stephen Greer show. Uh, Which is why I'm going to quickly read a little bit um, from someone's testimony of having been to one of his workshops. Uh, So, again, Stephen Greer's workshops, at least as of 2019, uh, for six nights under the stars with Dr. Stephen Greer. Uh, Again, they cost around $3,000. No food, no lodging. Which does not include your food nor your lodging. Um, if (laughs) If you are a returning... Uh, person it only cost about seventeen hundred dollars so you get a little better if, if you're coming back um, but I just want to read a little bit from this person's experience um, so this this was someone who was a big fan of of Dr. Greer uh, and really enjoyed the work he was doing and also listened to his meditation CDs oh we have to get our <laughs> hands on those meditation <laughs> CDs so this person says it was with great excitement that they signed up for a SETI presentation, which is a what SETI contact with extraterrestrial something. Yeah, yeah. I don't fully remember. Um, so this says, surprisingly, my preconceived opinion about Dr. Greer's character began to disintegrate as I listened to his presentation. It was disheartening to discover he is excessively fascinated with himself, which is not a quality... That it, this is not unique to Greer in the UFO mm-hmm. realm. There are quite a few narcissists. Um, anyway, he's extremely fascinated with himself, prone to indulge in name dropping and in bragging about his fantastic high end or in the know contacts and connections, not to mention the multitude of outlandish remarks he makes with a straight face, uh, such as that he rejected a $2 billion payout. $2 billion. $2 billion with, with a, a B. B. With a B. $2 billion payout to shut up and abandon the ET disclosure issue. Uh, he often describes himself as just a country doctor from North Carolina. He's just a country doctor. He's just a country boy. Um, and so this is the worst and most disheartening part of this experience Experience was witnessing the field contact protocols. Uh, this is something that by about part three of this documentary, and I'd say about halfway through... Uh, close encounters with the fifth kind mm-hmm. we start to get in somewhat to steven greer's contact protocols mm-hmm. um, which i'll also mention this documentary misrepresents by um the canadian prime minister or something declassified all ufo documents so that anybody could look at them um this information is portrayed right next to steven greer talking about his protocols and it almost creates this connection that like steven greer's protocols had something to do with the Canadian right or or the in when you use the word protocol you're going to in in such a, a rapid or so close together you're going to assume that the word is being used in the same way it's it's not it's not Mm -hmm. the protocols for uh, the canadian government is like a a series of of processes they do protocols in greer's terminology has to do with how he shoots his consciousness into space that's not I, i you know i didn't research the canadian protocols and what they are but i guarantee you the prime minister isn't shooting his consciousness into space and wasn't canada was it france Maybe it was France. I think it's France. I, I think it it's was France. France. It was France. 
Uh, so anyway, that this person writes that the worst and most disheartening part of this experience is, was witnessing the field contact protocols. Uh, at the site, a number of devices, such as a radio transmitter, uh, radio detectors, infrared scope, etc., were arranged. Even though I don't doubt Dr. Greer may have had several experiences in the past, what I observed in the field that night is inconsistent with his hyperbolic claims suggesting he can vector ETs and make them appear. Uh, his actions and the facts demonstrated that at the very least, this is a bold exaggeration. Uh, Dr. Greer made sure to bring out a series of possibilities for a no-show. So like covering his bases, if, if it doesn't work, this is why. Um, according to him, sometimes the ETs might not appear because there is one person in the group without good intent or a clean heart. Uh, or vote him <laughs> off the island. Vote him off the island. Uh, or, quote, the ETs feel threatened by U.S. military or even though they won't fully materialize, they will manifest in a thousand other ways. So let that sit for a second. Uh, this is a man who's saying... I, I want to go to one of these so bad. He's saying uh. the UFOs are here, aliens are here, but if they don't show up, it's mm -hmm. because A, someone might have an impure heart. B, they're afraid of the military tonight, so they're not showing up. Or C... They will manifest in a thousand other ways, not as a UFO or a light in the sky, but whatever Greer decides. I'm, <laughs> I'm sure those aliens are very afraid of the military <laughs> with their inferior technology. Uh, the, the last thing I wanted to bring up from this, if I can find it, um, is that there were parts. So this this is something that sort of jumped out to me. Um, this person says in the past, whenever I would read negative views about Dr. Greer, especially ones describing him as a narcissist, I would reject them and conclude they were made by people who couldn't handle the truth. But based on what I saw and experienced firsthand, it appears Dr. Greer is in love with himself. And because he sees himself as above others, he dislikes most people. Uh, however, he desperately craves attention, which coincides with the George Knapp quote that anytime mm -hmm. he's ever gotten an email from Greer, it's asking for money. Uh, and he created his e ET disclosure platform to attract as large an audience as possible uh, in order to get the recognition, the recognition and adoration he sorely needs. So, again, this is just one testimony. This is an Amazon review. I'm not saying this is the most conclusive uh, piece of evidence, but... If you watch this movie and really pay attention, to me it becomes clear Greer is a little obsessed with himself, at least a little bit, and this review just kind of gives gives a story to like how he actually acts. And, and I think it returns life. to what I'm saying about if you if you know that you're already giving information on kind of a, a shaky footing, like you already know you're you're fighting this uphill battle to get people to believe in aliens. You cannot present the information in a way that the way that you're presenting it itself is going to be suspect. Mm -hmm. I I cannot respect a documentarian that seems like they're doing it as a vanity project, which is why I also. I wasn't going to say it, but I can't stand Jeremy Corbell. Oh, like, yeah. get out of the picture. Like, show me the information. <laughs> but I don't understand why you have. <sighs> Jeremy Corbell is a topic okay, for another I'm, time. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm putting him back on the shelf. But, but you know, as, as something Corbell does, too, um, especially in the long Joe Rogan interview, you know, there are times where like Joe will ask a pretty good question to Bob Lazar and Jeremy kind of stamps it out. Uh, going to Stephen Greer, uh, the last, last thing I wanted to point out about this Amazon review is that this person points out that some people had become uncomfortable and would just ask questions like about what was going on or about what an ET is. Like, what is this alien? What are we doing? Um, and it says he treated some attendees who asked valid questions or made harmless remarks, but whose timing or subject he deemed inappropriate, uh, that he would treat them very, very poorly. And it's like going back to kind of our central claim here that like Greer, your main goal, all you have to do is just show us a good piece of evidence. Evidence is supposed to be questioned. Evidence is supposed to be scrutinized. And it doesn't seem that it seems Greer wants us doing that to everybody else mm -hmm. except him. So that's that's to me. Uh, it's a red flag. It's a huge red flag.
the thing that I found interesting about Stephen Greer as well is not just that his website was hard to find, but you would just think again, the, the way this documentary makes him seem is like if I Google Disclosure Project Stephen Greer, there's going to be articles written on him. There's going to be stuff I can look into. There's going to be maybe some fan sites, maybe some YouTube videos. There's really not that much. And the more I think that over, I'm wondering, is this just a guy who produces movies to get his own face out there and like no one really gives a shit about that's what him. it feels like uh one of the studios dg z <laughs> 60 if you google it th- it's just stephen greer's wikipedia page that appears so that's fine uh michael mazzola i thought was kind of interesting i looked into him and his uh imdb page is basically two very small credits on films over 10 years ago and then he's suddenly a producer on two of Greer's films. I just, I'm not saying that means anything. It's just odd. Like, all of the support can't come from the source. <laughs> right. That's strange. Uh, and then lastly, I'd say um, there is a production company called The Orchard uh, that picked up this film and probably helped it get onto Amazon and, and stuff like that. And,. But I would just say for for anyone, again, who still wants to be supporting Stephen Greer or really getting behind this movie, um, from what I can tell, I think The Orchard just saw this as a pretty pretty good opportunity. I think they know people are going to watch content like this. I think they... Like I said, it's it's entertaining. It is. It's just entertainment. And I think this is the official quote from from The Orchard about picking up this movie. Uh, There's no question, no matter your beliefs... The Dr. Greer has tirelessly and consistently exposed startling revelations about UFOs, technology, and the secrets being kept from the American public, said Paul Davidson, executive VP film and television for The Orchard. We are thrilled to be partnering with him to bring his most stunning work to the widest audience possible. Uh, to me, that basically just says The Orchard saw that there was some money to be made mm-hmm. with Greer. So I would caution anyone who sees a production company attached to this right. and, and they, think that it they have pretty obvious motivation. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a good deal. It's money. So that's, that's my kind of last warning about the production side of, of this film. Hello, fellow humans. Uh, this is Shane just popping in at the end to tell you this is only part one of a three part series Allison and I made about Stephen Greer's film, Unacknowledged. Uh, If you'd like to see parts two and three, uh, you can always hit that subscribe button. Uh, Leave a comment below to tell us uh, your opinions on the film, if you agree with us, if you disagree with us, if you found any interesting pieces of evidence or um, just anything about either this movie or Stephen Greer that maybe we haven't covered yet or that you find interesting. I'll also add that we are currently working on a series where we respond to each of the episodes of the Disclosure series, which has been airing weekly on the Gaia streaming service. Uh, If you'd like to follow our reactions to these episodes as they come out, again, feel free to subscribe uh, so you can keep up with those. We're going to try to release uh, one of those every week as the series is releasing. We are going to keep watching Alien movies because we like Alien movies. Uh, So eventually we will move on from Stephen Greer and on to other personalities and films and topics such as the Guy Hattel document or even locations like Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, So if if content like that appeals to you, um, please please stick around for the ride. We think it's going to be a lot of fun. Thank you so much and we hope to see you at the next video.